I'm really excited to talk about this work, especially here at CMU. Uh, many of you see me every day, but some of you may not know about the sort of things that me and my awesome students are working on. And so this is, I think, the first opportunity I've had to speak in front of Scilab uh, about some of the cool things that are going on. So I work in software security. Um, I've been doing this for a while now. And I think you know, software security traces back to my childhood when, as a little boy, I really liked war. And me and my friends, we would get in these epic battles with each other. And these epic battles were about attack and defense. We'd divide ourselves into teams, and we'd go out and, you know, one team would attack another one, and the other team would have to defend and sometimes retreat. And, you know, we used to go around, we'd have these toy guns, and we'd be like, pew, pew, pew to each other. I think probably all the boys here have experienced something similar. And the, the thing I love about computer security is this battle really continues. We don't have to give up that part of our childhood. But instead of having our toy guns, this battle is now between two computers. But it's still really a battle. It's between black versus white, good versus evil, you versus them. Now, of course, you know we don't have these toy guns anymore. We've changed our weapons. And our weapons are really what we call computer exploits. And the idea is when you attack someone, you're going to find a bug in a program. And then you're going to exploit that program to give you some sort of advantage. Now, for example, this is a real life exploit. It's not a O day. Uh, someone asked if I was going to be giving zero days here. No, this is actually a fairly old bug. But just to help define some of the vocabulary here, we have a program called IWconfig, which is used on old Linux systems to associate a wireless card to an access point. And if you run IWconfig with an access point name, a normal access point name, everything works as expected. It's OK. But there's some inputs which exploit the system. And an exploit is just an input. It's just an input. For example, this is a real life exploit where when you give it to IWconfig, you get a root shell. After you get a root shell, you can do anything you want. You can install a keylogger. You can delete files. You can add a backdoor. You can do whatever. Now, it's attack, and it's also defense which means the defender also wants to go find these exploitable bugs so that they can fix them before an attacker can exploit them. And so we have these two sides playing against each other, but both are trying to find exploitable bugs, one to fix them and one to break into the other system. Now, it's amazing how many programs are exploitable. For example, did you know that 99,000, there are 99,000 known bugs in Linux? 99,000 last time I checked. Now, some of these bugs aren't very serious. They're actually fairly benign, but some of them are quite deadly. The question is, which are deadly? And beyond the known bugs, there's always the threat of unknown bugs. For example, here's a very simple nine-line program. The first line of this program creates a very long file name. It's 8,000 characters long. And then for every program in user bin, for every command line option A to Z, it passes, it runs the program with that command line option with this very long file input. I did this on the latest Debian stable. Debian stable is a, a version of Linux that many people use to run critical servers. And just this, this very simple nine line program in 13 minutes checked 1,009 programs and found 52 new bugs, not in the Ubuntu or Debian bug database in 29 different programs. It's just ridiculously easy to find these bugs. But which ones are exploitable? Which ones are going to be advantageous to an attacker? And the way we go about answering that question now is we get really, really smart people. We get people trained here at CMU who are skilled in the art of exploit. They're experts in programming languages and machine architecture. And they can reason about assembly. And they can reason about corner cases. And I'm very fortunate to run one of the very best hacking teams out there. This is the CMU hacking team. And they enter professional contests quite often. And quite often, they win. For example, last time I checked in 2012, our team was ranked number one. And a dirty little secret is, well, the number 10 team is actually the Raytheon professional penetration testing team. So these aren't just other colleges that we're competing against. These are actually professionals who do this day in and day out. And this is the second year in a row that we were ranked number one. So we're quite good. I want to tell you a little bit about a contest that highlights some of the things I'm going to be talking about. And that's called DEF CON. DEF CON is the largest computer security industry conference uh, when it's held. It's held in Las Vegas every year, usually uh, early August or late July. And this is a graph 
showing various teams competing in the DEF CON competition. So we have on the x-axis time and on the y-axis we have points. And the cool thing is you'll see that towards the end of the contest, CMU takes the lead. It's this top dark purple line. It's, it's kind of difficult to see on this uh, particular projector, but it's a dark purple line. We're beating everyone else. Now, unfortunately, at the very end of the contest, one of the other teams came in and finally beat us at the very last minute, the very last minute. So they come in and at the very last minute beat us. Now, I still think this is a victory for CMU, and you know why? CMU went in with 20 students, people who don't have a day job in computer security. Their day job is learning things. And the number one team had 80 professionals, 80 professionals. But it also illustrates an important point. What happens when a team of 20 people go against 80 professionals? They're probably going to lose because there's 80 of them and 20 of us. What happens in computer security when there's more attackers than defenders? Nation states are starting to worry about this problem. The US worries about China. It, well, they worry about lots of places. What do we do when there's potentially a larger adversary, either numerically or otherwise, than us? Current techniques can't scale, because currently we rely on just training more people. And that's certainly something we need to do, but we also need to change our thought process. So there's a, a guy whose nickname is the great one, named Wayne Gretzky. He's got the most points in NHL history. This guy is just amazing. It's like when, he, when he's on ice, it looks like he's dancing. But he wasn't the biggest one out there. He wasn't the largest. He wasn't the fastest. And yet he's called the great one. And the reason for that is he, he could just score goals when no one else could. And he said the trick, the trick was he skates to where the puck, the hockey puck, is going to be, not to where it's been. And I thought this was an apt quote in computer security because a lot of our daily lives is spent focusing on how do we tackle today's threat, but we also need to focus on where things are going to be in the future. How can we get away from this manual process where it's 20... When 20 go against 80, the 20 will always lose, or at least potentially lose. And so my vision in our research, and actually all my students take part in this vision, is we want to automatically check the world's software for exploitable bugs. And there's two important words in this sentence. The first is automatically. We don't want it to be a manual process. And the second is we want to find the bugs that matter for security. There's 99,000 no bu known bugs. We want to figure which ones are exploitable for some definition of exploitable. Now, our main approach is program verification, but with a twist. Typically, what you do in program verification is you take in a program, and you take in a, a correctness property that's manually written, and then you have one of two outputs. You either say the program is correct, or you say it's incorrect. Now, the twist here is we're actually going to give an unexploitable property, and this particular property is going to be something that's universal across all programs. It's not going to really be program specific. And we're going to incrementally check the program, and we're going to be able to say either a program path is safe, or we're going to be able to say it's exploitable. But it's the, same, uh, it's the same kind of idea, and we use many of the same techniques as traditional program verification. Now, I want to show you at a, at, at a high level what these sort of techniques can do. And so this is automatic exploit generation, the sort of thing that we do in our research group. This is the same program I showed you before, IWconfig, and it has what's called a buffer overflow, and we'll talk about that more in this talk. In particular, um, there's a user input that's copied into a 32-byte data structure. It's a very classic attack. These things have been around forever, and they continue to be a problem. The program's about 1,400 lines of code. That's not including libraries. So it's not a huge program. It's not Internet Explorer, but it's reasonable size. What I'm showing here is that we want to take in the binary program. The binary program, there's no symbols. And we want a single command line option that systematically explores that program IWconfig, tries to find out where the bugs is, and for each bug, determine if it's exploitable. And here, we've said we've been able to find the exploitable bug. And the reason we know it's exploitable is we actually generated a working exploit. This is the real life exploit. This is what it looks like. And if you give this as input to the program, you get your root shell. So in 7.8 seconds, we owned the machine. A world in which this is possible is much different than the world we live in today, where we have to go hire the best and brightest to find exploitable bugs. This sort of world, we can go out and we can get huge compute farms to potentially rule out whether or not a particular program is exploitable, to find those exploitable bugs so they can be fixed first. But it's not the world we're living in today. It's the world that we want to be in. 
So we're doing this at a large scale. We want to automatically check the world's software. We're starting with Debian Linux. And we've taken 527 programs from user bin and bin. And we've taken the programs that read in from a file. So any program that reads in from a file we've looked at. And we checked 47% of the code on average out of those 527 programs. That leaves 53% more to do. But we're looking at a very large scale. And we're trying to make a real difference in the software that people use every day. And so of course, you know, when I say on average and things like that as scientists, you should know an average over what. And we'll get into that as well. So an outline for this talk is I need to first tell you about basic exploitation, how it works. I need to really define our vocabulary. And then I need to tell you how we go about automatically determining which bugs are exploitable. And the technique we use is called symbolic execution. And then I want to talk about automatic exploit generation in real code. Now, we've wrote a series of papers on this topic. What I want to focus on this is what we've learned over those papers. What are the fundamental principles that we use driving forward? And I want to talk about our experiments as well as, of course, the future. So in our research group, we primarily at this time focus on control flow hijacks. A control flow hijack is what you hear about in the media. It's things like buffer overflows, format string attacks, heat metadata overwrites, use after free. There's a number of different ways to hijack control flow. Now, these are going to be the same principle, but at different mechanisms. For clarity, I'm just going to focus on buffer overflows. But these same techniques work for these other types of attacks. And there's two things that we want to do. First, we want to take control of the execution. So we want to take control of how the program's executing. And then we want it to execute our computation. Now, I do want to take a moment, because some people here say, you know, buffer overflows are a well-known vulnerability. Aren't those passe? Aren't those gone? And the answer is no. These continue to be a problem despite years, even decades of research. We haven't addressed this problem adequately. For example, many of you have heard of Stuxnet. It was a worm that went in and realistically, it set back Iran's nuclear program years, took advantage of buffer overflows, took advantage of these same attacks. So in order to describe how buffer overflow works, I need to talk about how you hijack control. For example, in our IW config example, we're going to hijack control when the length of the input is greater than that of the buffer length. I need to talk a little bit about why this happens. And in order to tell you why you can hijack control when you're just, well, writing too much data into a buffer, I need to describe local variables, and I need to talk about the basic execution model. So I'm going to talk at these at a, at a high level. Of course, if you're really interested in these things, you should take our courses like 18.732 or 18.487. So the basic execution model on, um, and I'm going to focus here on x86, just because it's what we do all our experiments on, is pretty simple. Inside a running process, there's various regions of memories. There's a, a code segment of memory, there's a data segment of memory, there's a stack, and there's a heap. We have a processor, and the processor has a register called EIP. It stands for the instruction pointer, IP instruction pointer. And the IP points to the next instruction to execute. Now, it's important here to note that it's just pointing to some area memory. That's what it's going to do is it's going to look at that region of memory. It's going to fetch that, uh, a, a chunk of uh, data. It's going to decode it as an instruction, and it's going to execute it. Now, at a high level, what a control flow hijack is, is we're going to hijack control of IP. We're going to point it at some code we want to have it execute. And if we can do that, it's going to do what computers do. It's going to fetch what we point at. at. It's going to decode it and execute it as an instruction. All right, so I'm going to give you a very simple buffer overflow. Here's a program called Vulnerable. Buffer has, uh, Vulnerable has a buffer that's 32 bytes long. And it does a string copy of user input into this buffer. Now, there's two local variables here. There's a 32-byte buffer, and there's a 4-byte integer x. And so one of the things we have to take care of when we compile down a program is where are we going to allocate these buffers and variables in memory? And the way we do it is we allocate a stack frame every time a function is invoked. So the stack frame is going to have space for our buffers and local variables. For example, here, Vulnerable's initial stack frame will have 32 bytes for buffer, and it'll have four bytes for integer, and then it'll also have another four bytes for a pointer to that buffer. For example, when we run this program on the input ABC, ABC is, well, the string copy execute. We're going to write ABC into this area that's allocated for a buffer, and ABC will go into that correct memory region. And I have here the backslash zero just indicating it's null terminated. Now, in order to hijack control, I also have to tell you about how function calls work, because this is really an important property. 
if we have a caller to the uh, routine vulnerable, when caller executes, well, caller is going to need to save its place in its execution. And so what it does is it looks at the next instruction it wants to execute after vulnerable returns, and it puts that onto the stack. So for example, it's going to put put onto the stack the saved EIP, this is the saved IP value of the next instruction to execute, in this case it's I plus one. Now, when the function returns, that variable EIP is going to be popped into the EIP register. And since it pops it into the EIP, you know, the machine will ac execute as normal. It's going to fetch, decode, and execute whatever that, whatever that points to, and it's going to point to I plus one and operate as normal. This is really just the stack discipline. So a buffer overflow occurs when data is written outside the space allocated for the buffer. And then this is possible because C does not check that writes are within bounds. A classic exploit overwrites the saved return address in memory. So for example, if I give this vulnerable program 36 A's plus the string, the hex string, E-F-B-E-A-D-D-E, -E -E, when we execute the string copy, the first 34 A's are going to be copied into buffer. The next four A's will be copied over EIP because we don't check that we're writing outside the buffer. And well, the hex characters will overwrite the saved return address. Now, because of the way memory operations work on x86, it will actually write the integer dead beef in hex. Now, when we return from vulnerable, like before, we're going to pop off the return address into the IP register. We'll fetch, decode, and execute whatever is at address dead beef in memory. And more than likely, we'll get the dreaded seg fault. We'll crash. So that's the basic idea for how we can violate, well, really the semantics of a C program. How do we take advantage of this to execute our own code? The idea is that we're going to provide shell code. We're going to give to the program not only data that overwrites the buffer, but the code that we want to execute. And this is traditionally called shell code because it runs a command line shell. And once you get this command line shell, it will be running under the context of the vulnerable program, and the attacker can issue whatever command he wants. For example, he can issue copy commands, delete commands, uh, FTP commands, whatever. There are more advanced methods like return-oriented programming. We have work in this, but I'm just going to focus on the most basic scenario for clarity. So shellcode is just a string. One of the beauties in computer science is really code is data, data is code. So I can have this data, this string here, 0x31, 0xc9, 0xf7, and so on. And if I can point EIP at that, it will fetch, decode, and execute it as an instruction, and it will execute exec ve bin shell. So if we go back to our vulnerable function, when we execute the string copy, we provided our shell code plus the address of buffer. So when we give it the shell code, it overwrites the saved EBP, it overwrites the, the, the buffer space, and then we overwrite EIP with the address of the buffer that we want to transfer control to. Now, as part of the normal stack discipline, we're going to pop off the saved EIP into the EIP register on a return statement. And of course, this is the address of buff, and so it's just going to point to our shell code. And at that point, the processor will do what it's designed to do. It'll fetch, decode, and execute our shell code, and exec VE will be launched. This is the basic idea between, behind any control flow hijack attack. We're going to introduce code. We're going to overwrite a saved return address or other thing that's used to determine control flow. At some point, that's going to be loaded into EIP, and our shell code executes. Or in hacker terms, we've owned the machine. So our goal is to take this basic idea that currently is manually done, and we want to automate it. We want to teach a computer to do what our experts are doing. So we want to automatically find exploitable bugs. And I told you we're doing program verification, but with a twist. And the particular thing we're using is, as I said, called symbolic execution. And we're using symbolic execution to test program paths to see if they're exploitable or not. The basic idea behind symbolic execution is we're going to run a program, but we're going to run the program on an input variable instead of a concrete input. So typically, if I run this program on a concrete input, I would give it a particular number, like x equals 42, and let it execute, and it output something. Instead, we're going to execute it on a symbolic variable. We're going to essentially say x can be anything. We're then going to pick a program path via some uh, heuristic, and there's a number of heuristics people use out there. 
And then we're going to execute that path on the symbolic input. And as we execute, we're going to compute values, and our values are going to be the conditions necessary to execute the selected path. More formally, our values are going to become expressions. And so as we execute if x greater than 42, we're going to compute the value x has to be greater than 42. And to take the false path, we know that not only is x greater than 42, but x squared is not equal to max n, and so on. So at each step, we're going to create what is called in the area a formula. And these formulas capture the conditions necessary to execute the selected path up to that point. So we call these path formulas. There's lots of them, lots of them. We're going to create one for each path. In fact, we're going to create one for each point in each path that can poten potentially execute. Once we create a path formula, we can find inputs that would execute that path in real life by giving these formulas to what are called satisfiability modular theory solvers, SMT solvers. You can think of these as kind of as SAT solvers. We're going to give it this formula, and it's going to give us back a satisfying answer to this formula. For example, 43 satisfies this particular formula, because if we plug in 43 for x, 43 is greater than 42. That's true. 43 squared is not equal to max int, and it's not true that 43 is less than 42. So we can build these path formulas. We can give it to these SMT procedures, and we can get back satisfying answers. And the cool thing is, when we get back a satisfying answer, each satisfying answer is actually a real life input that executes the selected path. This is the basic idea. And the cool thing is, we can incrementally select new paths. For example, we can select this path, pass it to the SMT solver, and come up with inputs that execute the selected path. Now, sometimes we may come up with an unsatisfiable solution. This corresponds to input paths that can never be executed. For example, here I've selected an input path where x has to be greater than 42 and x has to be less than 42. There's no satisfying answer to this formula, and so there's no input that will take that selected path. Now, as we're doing this, at the same time, we're also checking for non-exploitability. So we're checking each program path to see if it's safe. For example, if we get to a vulnerable point in our code, something we want to check, we have the program path up to the point the program path up to this point is x greater than 42 and x squared uh, equal max int. And then we check this safety property that we encode in, uh, well, it turns out we just encode it in logic. In particular, what we encode at this point is that EIP is not affected by user input. So if you think about this, what we're checking is, is there an input that can execute this path? And is it true that that input will never affect or never be loaded into the EIP register? Now, suppose there was such an input that could execute the selected path and be loaded into EIP. Well, that means we could hijack control. And so for each path, we're going to check the path formula and whether or not the saved EIP can equal the user input, whether or not we can write outside bounds and we can target that area of memory or the various area of memories. There's other areas of memory, like function pointers, um, uh, the got, things like that, um, to see if we can overwrite them such that we can hijack control. And in each step, we're going to either get back one of two answers. We're either going to get back sat, meaning the program path is safe, or we're going to get back unsat, meaning that, well, we can create an exploit, because it doesn't satisfy our non-exploitable property. So, so far, I've given it a high level how exploit generation can be cast as a verification problem. What we want to verify is, is it true that I can, well, overwrite these areas of memory that are loaded into EIP and eventually run our shellcode. The real question is, how do we make this practical? And this is a question people have been asking for a while now. The earliest reference I found started in 2005, where Randy Bryant and one of his students named Ganapathy created a wrote a paper called Automatic Discovery of API Level Exploits. In this particular paper, what they were looking at is, given a particular API call, is there an input that just given that API call would exploit that API call? They didn't look for inputs starting at the beginning of execution to actually execute that API call. That was out of scope. But it was really cool work. It actually showed that exploit generation was possible. And they actually looked at um, overriding return addresses as well as exploiting cryptographic processes. Since then, there's been a lot of work, quite a bit from our group here at CMU as well as others in the field, that have looked at can we, uh, can we scale these techniques? Can we make them work on broader classes of programs? Um, and we've been doing this for a number. In fact, we've also looked at things like can we take an exploit against an undefended system and make it work against a defended system? More realistically, can we take an exploit that works against Windows uh, XP Service Pack 1 without ASLR and DEP, if you know what those are, and can we turn it into one that we can use against, for example, with Windows 7 with ASLR and DEP enabled? And we've shown that we can do that as well. 
Sometimes this is called weaponizing exploits. We just really wanted to show that defenses currently are inadequate. So we've been doing this for a while. We've gained a lot of experience. And what I want to tell you really in this talk is what our experience has been and what are the kind of the principles we found when trying to apply verification in this large setting. And really, it's come down to three sets of principles in our setting. First, we need to run our analysis on binary code. And there's two reasons for that. First, of course, everyone has access to binary code, which makes our techniques applicable to a wide audience. But second, and more fundamentally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to argue about runtime properties. And so we need to analyze the code that's actually going to run. When we do this analysis, for example, on source code, and we've actually looked at that, it can be a little bit faster. But we run into these fidelity problems where we're analyzing code that's going to be compiled. And so we have a bit of uncertainty about the code that will actually run. And so we spent a lot of time developing binary analysis techniques to cope with this challenge of only requiring the binary. And uh, there's been a, a lot of research on this. In fact, we have an open source project called BAP where we publish the sum of our knowledge in source code form so others can use it. The second thing that we've uh, had to tackle is how do we tackle this state space explosion problem when doing any sort of verification? So um, our main approach is we need to use intelligent analysis to reduce the state space. So let me talk a little bit about how big it is. So the state space in most of the programs we look at is infinite. There's an infinite length input that most of these programs would take. We certainly don't want to check the infinite number of paths corresponding to that state space. So how can we reduce it so that we check, well, only the essential paths? And we come up some, with some techniques to help us with this. I, I do want to mention that these sort of techniques are equally applicable in things like bounded model checking that have the same sort of problem. They're going to incrementally explore a state space. And they really want to focus on only the things that potentially could violate a property. And then finally, and I think um, one of the things we've most recently come to realize is these SMT queries, we need to make them as easy as possible. Originally, when we started out exploit generation and binary analysis in general, we looked at these SMT procedures as black boxes. We're going to create a formula. We're going to give it to an SMT, and it's going to return SAT or unsat. And I think that that approach is wrong. I think you should think of these SMTs as some sort of search procedure, and you need to program to that search procedure. We found examples, and I'll, and I'll talk about some here, where if we ask the same question, the same semantic question, two different ways, way one, the SMT procedure runs off an exponential cliff and never gives us an answer. And the other way gives us an answer back in a tenth of a second. So we've really come to this idea of programming the SMT. So these are really the principles we learned. Let me give you some examples. And I'm really going to just focus on the last two. The first is this potentially infinite state space. So remember, I had this string copy of input to the buffer. And everyone's like, you know, C is passe. It's not a big problem. But this is a fundamental issue in any program language. Because that string copy, although it's an API call, is really just a for loop. This for loop just copies data from one buffer to another until a null character is found. And the way symbolic execution views this is a sequence of if-then-else statements, where each if-then-else statement corresponds to executing that loop one more time. So at the top, we say, is it true that input at 0 is equal to the null character? If so, do one thing. Otherwise, do something else. That corresponds to 0 length strings. Then we check to see if input at 1 is equal to 0. That corresponds to inputs of length 1, and so on. And so previous work had really tackled this by just, well, enumerating every single program branch. So for that string copy, what they would do is create a formula for, you know, let's say the zero length strings, go explore the program and figure out there's no way to exploit this program with a zero length string, which kind of makes intuitive sense, right? But they'd waste 20 minutes actually analyzing the program with respect to this, this condition that the input is of zero. And that condition is, is set by this first branch. And then they'd go and they'd look at, for example, the next branch, they'd backtrack and go re-explore the program, but now underneath the condition that the input is of length one. And again, they would not find any bugs and maybe waste 30 minutes doing that and so on. And they'd systematically do this. And eventually, there's no reason to believe they wouldn't find the exploitable bugs. But at least in all our test cases, state-of-the-art symbolic execution engines like, like CLI couldn't find even the simplest vulnerable vulnerabilities in programs, like our IW config example I've been using all along. And so one of the things that we realized is just blindly going down each path isn't ever going to work. We need to actually bring some additional information in to prune out parts of the search space that can't possibly be exploitable. Like often you can look at a program and you can say there's no way that any input of length one will ever exploit that program. It has to be at least as big as the minimum size buffer. So if we analyze this program, what we do is we do a bit of static analysis. And we can infer things like to overwrite the saved EIP, we need 40 bytes. 
and all those bytes need to be non-null. And we can do this statically. More generally, we have something we call preconditioned symbolic execution. You can think of there's some set of all inputs to the program, and there's some, set of, some subset of those that trigger bugs, and some subset of that that not only trigger bugs, but also do a control flow hijack. What we do is we do lightweight program analysis to come up with preconditions to find inputs within this control flow hijack space. For example, in our running example, we know that the input has to be at least greater than the length of the buffer. These sort of analysis are cheap, they're easy, and they can be used to, to focus our search on at least the regions of code that may be exploitable. So we have lots of examples of those. I'm just going to give you the kind of the intuitive ones here. And the easiest one is a length precondition, where we go through and we look at all the buffers in a program, and we say, well, it's the case that an input has to at least be as big as the smallest buffer in order to exploit this program. So in this example, we'd say something like our precondition check is the length of the input is greater than 40. And then we also check our path formula underneath this precondition uncovered with the static analysis. So for example, is it true that the length of the input greater than 40 and input at 0 equals 0 can be satisfied? And a little bit of thought of this is, well, if input at 0 and 0 is satisfied, that, that means the input is of 0 length. And it, of course, it can't be the, true, be the case that a 0 length input also is greater than 40. So we have an unsatisfiable query, and we won't explore that part of the execution space that previous work would. And we'll save, like, let's say, 20 minutes. And we go back to the next if-then-else statement. We add these preconditions uncovered with static analysis. Do the same check. Find out no inputs of length 1 can exploit the program, and so on. Maybe save 30 minutes, and so on. We do this. And this is the reason that we're able to find exploits for, in programs like IWconfig in 7.8 seconds when previous tools couldn't find them given hours. As we use lightweight static analysis to infer some invariance on what you need for exploiting, and we use those to guide symbolic execution as we go. So the second principle, I, or the third principle I talked about, is we don't want to treat these SMT solvers as a black box. We're creating a lot of these queries. Previously, we just gave the formula that we created via whatever method we had to the SMT solver, and we hoped and prayed that it returned either SAT or unsat within our lifetime. And this turned out to really be, I think, the wrong approach. You need to open up the black box of SMT. You need to think of it as a search procedure, and you need to figure out how to program your queries to, make best, to take best advantage of that search procedure. So one of the hardest cases for us was what we call symbolic memories. It continues to be a challenge, but it's, it's, it's really one of the hardest cases. For example, here we have a program that reads in user input, and then executes, and then use that user input to load some value for memory. So we have memory at x. We're loading some value from x. And then we have to assert that that value in memory is equal to 42. Now, in naive symbolic execution, really what we're doing is we're saying, well, x can be anything. And so we're forcing the SMT, well, not forcing it, but a naive implementation of an SMT is considering all possible memory cells. And it's saying, which of these 2 to the 32 possible memory cells that you could be dereferencing contains the value 42? And that's a huge search space for the SMT itself. These sort of things happen all the time. The most common case are what we call table lookups. For example, the two lower function is essentially an index table in memory that maps uppercase letter A to lowercase letter A, uppercase letter B to lowercase letter B, and so on. And so every time you call two lower, you have one of these symbolic indices if what you're calling it on is user input. It's using the user input as an index into memory. There's many, many causes of this. Every time you call scanf, vprintf, printf, you'll run into a symbolic memory in real code. Every time you convert between Unicode and ASCII, you run into symbolic memory via conversion routines like to lower, is space, is alpha. All these things make it very, very hard to reason about it. And just a single instance of one of these symbolic memories can prevent us from continuing to explore a particular program path, from finding new bugs, from finding new exploitable bugs. So what previous work had done is what they'd done what's called concretization. In fact, this is still done at Microsoft today. So what concretization does is say, let's pick a particular value for that memory, uh, for that memory reference and just check that one. For example, we may just say x has to be equal to 42. I'm sorry, x has to be equal to 17. And so we only consider the values when x equals 17 and say, is it true that memory, memory cell 17, is it equal to, to 42? This way, the decision procedure doesn't have to reason about all two, 2 to the 32 different memory cells. So 
at a high level, this seems good because it makes these formulas solvable. It's kind of a practical trade-off where we reduce the search space to make it so we can get an answer in our lifetime. However, we found in 40% of our test cases, this prevented us from finding exploits when an exploit really was possible. The second approach is really to do nothing, to leave it fully symbolic. And the pro of this, of course, well, I mean, this is essentially referencing all memory cell, and the pro, pro of this, of course, is theoretically we can find exploits when there really is an exploit, but in practice, these formulas aren't solvable. The SMT just times out. It uses too much memory, takes too much time. And so uh, we have a very simple observation. As you're executing, you don't have to reason about, you're not actually asking the SMT to reason about all of memory. In fact, the path that you've executed so far informs the, should be informing the SMT as to which areas of memory you care about. For example, in this particular example, we know to reach the symbolic memory here at the bottom that x has to be somewhere between 42 and 50. And so the SMT should really only reason about values of memory between 42 and 50. Now, since I know some people work on SMT here, really the trick is to tell the decision procedure to reason about the value x before it reasons about this symbolic memory x. We have to direct it on what to reason about first. That's the problem. So we have two different, uh, uh, at the start of this, we had a two-step process. The first thing is we bound memory addresses referenced, again, with a static analysis over the path we've executed. And then we make a search tree of memory, ad memory address values. So the first step, what we do is we say, well, you know, if we have mem at x and 0xf, what are the upper and lower bounds for x itself? And we use an analysis called value set analysis, which is supposed to be an over approximation for the range of values that a particular variable can take on. We then actually use the SMT itself to refine these bounds. And we found this SMT querying as a second step actually refined the bounds enough to make it worthwhile. The se second step is once we refound the bounds, we created a search tree that included every memory value within those bounds. So for example, if we had that x could be 1, 2, 3, or 4, we went into memory and we said memory at value 1 has the value y equals 10. And if, if you're referencing cell 2, the value in memory at cell 2 is 12. And if you're referencing cell 3, the value is 22, and so on. So one way to look at this is, well, I mean, we're having a set of if-then-else statements. So you can think of the index as being on the x-axis and the value that's being indexed on the y-axis. And what we ended up doing is not just encoding this if-then-else statement, we actually encoded a binary search tree into our SMT query itself that essentially said, you know, if it's true that x is less than 3, go left, otherwise go right. And if x is less than 2, go left, otherwise go right. And we encoded this in our formula, trying to force the SMT to take a particular search order to resolve variables. Now, one of the cool things is I have very, very smart students. And they, this is actually not such an unknown thing to do. Various SMTs support if-then-else statements, in fact. But they went one step further. They said, you know, if you think about this as, as x versus y, you have your index on your x-axis and your memory value on the y. Why are you thinking of search tree at all? In fact, why don't you just think of these as a piecewise set of linear equations? So we have our index. We have our memory value. We can just create a set of piecewise linear equations shown here with the red bar. For example, maybe we create two linear equations, y equals negative 2x plus 28 and y equals 2x plus 10, and use those in the SMT. And the beauty of this is we've moved all symbolic memory accesses altogether. We've taken a memory operation and we reduced it to a linear equation, which are fast. So instead of encoding these memory operations, we actually encode now, a set of piecewise linear approximations. So this particular technique is what allows us to solve 40% more than our predecessors using the same SMT procedure. So our experiments. There's really two questions we want to ask. Can we find and exploit known exploitable bugs? Because if you can't exploit known exploitable bugs, what value is of it? And can we use this to start checking all of Linux? So we've ran a series of tests where we've looked at um, 29 different programs, 22 of them on Linux, 7 of them on Windows. We just wanted to make sure that we could do this on Windows, that there wasn't something fundamental about it. And we were able to exploit all these. And on the x-axis, I have the number of seconds it took to generate the exploit. So you can see, uh, this is a log scale. You can see many of them took 10 seconds or less, though we do, in one case, go all the way up to uh, 10,000 seconds. 
In fact, two of these bugs were unknown bugs. We started out saying, can we exploit known bugs? And then we just let our process run a little too long and we discovered two unknown bugs where we found the known bug first and then we ran it and we found the new bug first. So these are what are called zero days. So we showed that it's effective. The next thing we want to do is we want to use this for good. And so really our mission right now is we want to check 100% of the lines of code in user bin and bin. Now I didn't say verify. We're not going to be able to verify these are safe. But we can certainly come up with an input that tests each line of code, and that's a start. So we picked 527 programs. So far, we found 95 new bugs, five of which are exploitable. Yes? The question is, is this a 32-bit system or a 64? We're currently looking at Debian stable, 32-bit. Can you use the microphone, please? I can't hear you. So in 64-bit system, uh, Intel has an execute disable bit in the page, paging structure, which can possibly prevent the overflow attacks. So are you considering those? So the question is, on 64-bit systems, there's an extra detail that makes sometimes a program unexploitable and it would be exploitable on a 32-bit system. Our system would uncover that sort of condition. We're not currently taking it under consideration now because we're not looking at 64-bit, but the logic itself would, would follow through. So this is the, I told you this is, you know, 47% on average. It actually looks like this. There's some programs here on the x-axis. It's a program. We have coverage on the y-axis. Some programs we checked 100% of. Some programs were mostly, were pretty close to zero. In fact, every day one of the things I do is I check a web page, our Mayhem web page, that gives us our overall coverage here. It shows how we've improved over time. And for each program, we know how much we've covered so far. So for example, WBM to PBM, which is an image conversion utility, we've checked 100% of. If we go to Perl, we've checked 20% of the code. And I can click on Perl, and I can show you how our analysis has progressed over time. And this dip is a, an error in our measuring coverage. It's not a, not a big deal. If we go to SED, we're at 56%. And you can see you know, it goes up every so often. So every day I check that. Now, some of you may say, well, you know, many of those programs actually share common libraries. So how many unique lines of code have you checked? So what we did is we took all the source for all the programs we've looked at. We've catted it together. We then sorted out and figured out how many unique lines of codes there are. Turns out there's about 2.8 million lines of code in the fi uh, 527 programs we looked at. So far, we've looked at 357,000 lines of code, 12.68%. So that's kind of two, two different metrics. One is 47% on average. This is if you use GCOV. And the other is if you look at unique lines of code, 12.68%. Yes? Um, Professor Brownlee, what do you mean by covered, covered here? Yes, what do I mean by covered here? I mean that we've come up with an input that will execute 357,000 of the 2.8 million lines of code. So we've tested at least one path through that code. So the cool thing about this is We've also done large-scale experiments on the fundamental architectures that we're using. For example, we create these path formulas. We've created 1.5 billion formulas. 1.5 billion. Now, because this is such a large number, it behooves us to actually have a formula cache to prevent us from asking the same question repeatedly. Turns out 5.6 million of them actually get to the SMT. So this tells us things like improving the cache is very, very important. The more we can get cache it's the better. We also know about 46% of the queries are satisfiable and about 54% are unsatisfiable. So if we want to optimize something, we should optimize unsatisfiable requests. We also started looking at, you know, where are we spending our time? I asked my students the following question. Where are we spending the most time so that we can go and optimize it? And I expected them to come back and say it was the SMT. And they initially came back and said, no, nah, the SMT is only 17% of the time we're spending in total. But that number is a little bit deceptive. It's actually a good scientific principle where you shouldn't look at averages. I have here a graph which shows on the x-axis the, uh, the log two time of the total time in seconds we've spent. And on the y-axis, we have the time. And we've broken it out into green, which is everything else but the SMT, and red, which is the SMT. So you can see, as we first start out, for the first one second, we spend almost all our time in the instrumentation, the engine, very little time in the SMT. But as we go deeper, we end up spending proportionally more time in the SMT. So although our average time in the SMT right now is only 17%, we expect it to grow as we get deeper, as we continue this analysis. 
So I say it's a great it's a great lesson because it's showing that averages can be deceptive. You also should look at trends. And this trend is showing us SMT is going to be a bottleneck as we get deeper. So I have this here, like a trick question. I always try to give people like some interview advice. This is a trick question interviewers can ask you. It comes from Steven Rudish. The question is, name one thing most people have more than average of. And many people will get this question wrong. How can most people have more than average of anything? How can it be that most drivers are better than average? And then you laugh at them. But it actually could be the case. Because for example, most people have more fingers than average because the average number of fingers is like 9.9. The other thing that we've learned is a lot about how we're using the SMT in, in uh, um, our program analysis differs from how the designers of SMT think people use them. For example, we show that 99.99% of all queries that get through the SMT are answered in about a second or less. To get that last 0.01%, you have to go up to 138 seconds. Everything above that, of course, timed out. So this tells us that the likely bang for the buck is to actually optimize fast queries. Now, I talked to people like Clark Barrett and Cesare Tonali, who work in uh, SMT, and they say, you know, this is something we're not really focusing on right now. It's actually good information because it shows us how the program analysis community, how the security community can better make use of these. We should optimize these fast queries. We can also say things like, well, you know, as you're doing symbolic execution, some people said these formulas are going to get bigger, therefore they must get harder to solve. And our current results show that that's not a foregone conclusion. We're still doing more analysis in this. We haven't reached a definitive conclusion, but I want to share some of our preliminary results. So this is a graph showing the size of a formula on the x-axis and the solve time on the y-axis. And I've plotted here both the SAT and the unsat queries in case they were different. So SAT is green, unsat is red. And what this is showing is as we get bigger, as we get bigger, doesn't necessarily mean they get harder. In fact, this right here is kind of an interesting hump. It, it kind of indicates that you know, initially things are very fast because pretty much any answer is a satisfying answer. At some middle point, it actually has to do some search and it's slow. And then at the end, you've added in enough constraints that, again, it doesn't have to do any search. And we're still trying to validate that series, that thesis. We're speculating that's the case. There could be other explanations. For example, it could be the case that these just kind of go off and become uh, timeouts later on. We haven't actually designed anything that can track these things yet. We also know that formula appear to become easier as exploration goes deeper, which, you know, as you get deeper, you're going to have larger formulas. This just correlates with the previous experiment. So it looks very, very similar. This is the depth we've gotten in a program on the x-axis and the solve time on the y-axis. And you can see most things, as I said, take a second or less. We can also tell you cool things, like suppose you ask me what are the hard instances. I can tell you all the hard instances we've seen come from these 46 programs. So we're looking at 527, and only 46% of them, 46 of them are creating queries where the solve time is greater than one second. This is the sort of thing you don't get if you just go and look at one or two programs. Because if I looked at one or two programs, or even 10 programs out of those 527, more than likely I would just get the easy programs, and I wouldn't actually see the full distribution of the sort of queries you, should, you would get in a large-scale deployment. This is a 4D graphic. What it's showing is for those hard formulas, those ones that take one second or less, or one second or greater, um, that as they get uh, bigger, as the depth that we go goes deeper on the x-axis, how much time it takes to solve. And then we've color coded them by also uh, the number of AST nodes. So we have um, yellow, and then we have uh, purple. So this is just kind of showing you they do get larger as you get deeper, and also they tend to get easier to solve for the ones we do solve. So we're getting this really cool data. I mean, you know, we have 1.5 billion SMT queries, 5.6 million going to the SMT solvers. To the best of my knowledge, this is probably the second biggest use of SMT. I think Microsoft is probably the biggest, but we're, we're, we're pretty close. We're into the billions of constraints. So there's many things that we're not perfect on. We don't claim to find all exploitable bugs. This is where we differ from the traditional verification community. Traditionally, verification says they're sound, meaning that they only say a program is bug-free if it really is bug-free. So we've invented a new term. We've invented a term called actionable. We only want to tell you there's a security-critical bug when there really is one. Because we know there's 99,000 bugs out there, what we want to know are which ones we should prioritize first. We also only make all our claims of exploitability versus safe with respect to a fixed input size. So for example, we can tell you for many programs that no input greater than 10, 15, 32 characters will exploit the program. 
So there's lots of work we could do there. You know, the sort of guarantees we give are different than the traditional verification community. We can make better symbolic executors. We can look at additional safety properties. One of the things we want to look at is information flow, for example. Um, so it's, it's, there's, there's lots that isn't perfect that we have to work on. In fact, there's, I think, seven different theses we've mapped out in this area. But we continue to work on it. And at a high level, there's three things we want to do. The first is we want to continue to formalize what it means to exploit a system. And by formalize, I mean come up with the right formalization that doesn't just characterize what it means to exploit a system, but is also efficient to check. There's many ways you can formalize a problem, and often it's coming up with the right formalization that allows you to make progress. The second thing that we work a lot on is binary program verification techniques. For example, we're starting to investigate modular symbolic execution. Currently, symbolic execution starts when a program starts and ends when you get as far into the program as you can get. We want to be able to jump into the middle of a program and be able to do symbolic execution. And finally, and probably most importantly, we want to work on real code. We're not satisfied to go find 10 running examples that we can now check. We want to look at 500. We want to look at all of Unix if we can. And so we have this goal of getting 100% code coverage. And I just want to leave you with this, this final thought. We've checked 47% of code. We've come up with test cases for 47% of the lines of code on average. It seems wrong not to at least get to 100%. In fact, my personal belief is if we ever want to have hope in verifying 100% of the kit code, we at least have to come up with a test case for 100% of the code. So with that, I'm done. Any questions? Yes. That's a good question. The question is, how do we come up with the preconditions that weed out parts of the search space? Some of them, like the length of inputs, we can actually come up with by automatic program analysis. Our techniques are not precluded to that, though. Anything you can encode in logic, we can use. And so we have looked at heuristics uh, as well. Another thing that we're continuing to work on with CERT is, for example, if you give me a crashing input to the program, can I use that to guide the search space to say, hey, explore nearby paths to see if those are exploitable, or even the crashing one is exploitable? Yes? So the example that you had earlier with the, the stack buffer overflow, I realize it's, it's the, the, the simplest case just for a one hour presentation. But, yes. Um, and so the goal is to look for something where you can get EIP. Um, how do you handle cases where there are things like a stack canary involved? Oh, that's a, you do have a stack buffer overflow, but there's yeah. some other verification that occurs. Yep, that's a good question. So we actually delineate a couple different things. First, we look at, is the program itself with no defense mechanisms, is it exploitable? Because often programs will get compiled on many different environments, some without those, like stack canaries, ASLR, and depth. And so most of our work shows, is it exploitable on some architecture? Now there are different defenses you can turn on, like stack canaries, um, ASLR, and depth. And we have work in what we call exploit hardening, where given an exploit that works against an undefended system, can we make it work against a defended system? So something like a stack canary, we would look at, you know, can I overwrite uh, a function pointer or a read or write pointer to write past the canary, right, without overwriting the canary in a, in a straight thing. Most of our work, quite honestly, is focused on defeating ASLR and depth, not really stack canaries at this point. Um, but we differentiate between these, these three things because we think each are interesting problems. Yes? How hard is it, uh, how hard it is to defeat uh, ASLR and depth? How hard is it to defeat ASLR? I think that's your question. So it depends. If it was correctly implemented on a 64-bit system, it would be very hard. However, Windows 7 does not completely implement ASLR on at least Windows 7. For example, the text section is not randomized. And we showed something like 85% uh, of programs bigger than bin true, we can come up automatically with a ROT payload. So we're not over, you know, I mean, yeah. So we can come up with a ROT payload and defeat ASLR on Windows 7 with high probability. We haven't tested Windows 8, so I don't know. They may be randomizing the text section now uh, by default. You had a question? No? I, I, yeah. I was just curious what you meant by random, what, by not randomizing the text section. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so there's various sections that you can randomize. There's the heap, there's the stack, there's the text section. These are all different. And traditionally, you look for ROP. Traditionally, people looked at the libraries themselves, the DLLs, and tried to find ROP gadgets there. What's happened is people have randomized the libraries. So you can't go find deterministic ROP payloads there, but they haven't randomized the text section. 
And so you can still go find ROP gadgets inside the text section. Now, my understanding is that Microsoft themselves randomizes the text section now, but no one else does. But there's these different sections, and unless you randomize them all, you can go still find gadgets, which means you can make ROP work. I guess my understanding of the text section is that's a section of like an executable module, and if the module is opting into ASLR or using something like Emmet, it is going to be randomized. I, maybe I'm not clear as to what, what, what is a, a text section that's not associated with an executable module. Uh, it is an executable module. You have the same thing, but on Windows 7, it's not randomized. The text section. Like if you go and, if you go and look at the actual systems, yeah. Okay. We have a paper called Q, and you can go read all the details there. You could go randomize it. There's no reason why not, right? Yeah. Yes. So as you, uh, as you looked at multiple applications and multiple programs to, uh, to process and look for vulnerabilities, in Linux and in Windows, I'm sure as well, um, there is quite a bit of code sharing going on among um, applications. And yes. Um, have you tried to optimize your search by um, detecting that there is a code that's, uh, that you've already seen? Oh, that's a good question. OK, so the question is, there's a lot of code sharing. So I gave you two numbers, and I actually pointed out the code sharing, right? We haven't made use of this inside Mayhem itself. We haven't said, hey, let's go analyze all the library and then make use of that every time we analyze an application that makes use of it. That's an obvious thing we'd want to do. Now, there's actually quite a bit of theory that's, that, that needs to be resolved in order to do that. Because usually modules are called with some sort of state. And so we need to reason about all possible executions of that state. We have done stuff at sor the source code level where we just said, hey, you know, here's a bug in source code. Go find me all the different code copies that still contain that bug. And we found 15,000 in 20 minutes, and that was a paper. In fact, you can go to our website, and you can go look for the 15,000. Yeah. So code sharing is a big deal. Other questions? Yes. Um, so the question is, why do we have so many unsat or satisfiability? One of the things that we are having uh, a current research topic on, and one of the things we're spending a lot of time, is to try to explain this result. So step one was just to show feasibility. Step two, we're collecting large data. Explaining these results is actually not trivial. Because we have to be able to take this unsatisfiability query. We have to go and back and backtrack that into the code, point out why the code is, and then we have to come with an analysis why it's hard. Is it hard intrinsically, like are we trying to invert a hash function? Or is it hard for some silly reason? Well, the, it, uh, I'm not sure what your question is. The green points are satisfiable queries, and the red points are unsatisfiable queries. Oh, how many dots we have. So, so the number of dots corresponds to how many queries we could ask total. So in this program, we could only ask one query. Everything else timed out. Oh. Yep. Yes. So if you are finding bugs in these programs, exploitable bugs, what are you doing with them? Are you reporting them to the open source community, or are you sitting on them? Or? <laughs> Yeah, I always joke, this is my retirement plan if tenure doesn't work out. <laughs> the reason I ask is sometimes, from my experience, you know, it's difficult to find the maintainer or to get them to fix bugs. So I wonder if you guys have dealt with that at all. I couldn't honestly answer that question because I don't actually know. My students have reported some. Some of them we haven't reported yet because we're still uh, doing some analysis and we just have lots and lots of things to do. Now, many of the bugs that, that are exploitable, we can get root on them. Some are going to argue they're not on the attack surface, and I think that's a fair, a fair thing to say. However, some of them are on the attack surface that you wouldn't expect are on the attack surface. For example, DVIPs, many people say, aren't on the attack surface until they go and install a web server that actually you can upload DVI files to, and then it calls DVIPs on whatever you upload it, and then it is on the attack surface. So we tend to be conservative on what we think is on the attack surface. Some people don't believe in conservative. These are the people who actually have to go and break into systems. And yeah, we don't. We, we limit how much weaponization we do for obvious reasons. So I, I don't think selling them is in our immediate future. Yeah. 
I would like to. Is Mayhem available online? No. We can find exploitable bugs. We don't give it away. BAP is available for free, our binary analysis architecture. Uh, is any other company doing systematic verification like Microsoft? I, I, don't, I don't know. So one thing I do know is Microsoft has gone from one of the most exploited platforms to actually being pretty reasonable. And in my mind, if we did as much verification as Microsoft does internally on everyone who uses Microsoft and all of Linux, the world would be a much safer place. Yeah, yeah, lots of people do. Yeah, you're talking about Coverity? Yeah, yeah, Coverity does bug finding. So they're one of the people who keep saying there's 99,000 bugs, and they'll find lots more bugs than we will, but many of them are false positives. So, yeah. Other questions? No? All right, thank you.